singularity. We're here today with uh, a person who hardly should need any introduction, Dr. Michio Kaku. Dr. Kaku, thank you very much for having us as your guest today. Well, glad to be on your show. Fantastic. So let's just jump in. Uh, Dr. Kaku, I want to begin our question today with, with this. You're a world famous physicist who traditionally looks very far away outwards. So what is it that made you shift your gaze in the exact opposite direction and look inwards into the future of the mind? Well, if you were to summarize the two greatest unsolved problems in all of science, they would be first in outer space, that is the creation of the universe. What happened before the Big Bang? Why was there a bang? What set off the Big Bang? And then the second big question would be from inner space. What is the origin of intelligence and consciousness? And as a physicist, I realized that on one hand, I make my living working on the first question. That's my day job. I work on string theory. But I've often been puzzled by exactly how the mind works. And physicists have asked this question for decades. For example, in quantum theory, we have the whole question of the observer and the observed. But an observer requires consciousness. And we have Nobel Prize winners, Nobel laureates like Eugene Wigner, Steve Weinberg, who differ on the fundamental question of consciousness. And so this has been really at the center of debate. But we have this black hole. And that is, whenever you talk about consciousness, you get a lot of nice sounding words, but almost no content. Mm -hmm. Now, so what in that, well, tell us perhaps the background story of, of how that interest arose in it and why was it so important for you? Well, I'm a scientist. And when we try to look at something, we try to quantify it. We try to rank it in terms of levels, give a numerical scale. But when you look at consciousness, you realize that there are over 20,000 papers written on it by theologians and ministers and psychologists. Never in the history of science have so many devoted so much to produce so little. And so being a physicist, I say, well, how would a physicist approach a solar system, an atom? First, we describe the electron in space. That's the first thing we do. Try to understand planets and motions in terms of space. Then we try to understand their relationship to other electrons, other planets, stars, for example, creating solar systems. And then stage three, <clears throat> we go forward in time, and we make predictions about the future behavior of planets going around stars. And so when you apply the same methodology to consciousness, you realize that there really are three stages of consciousness. Consciousness that understands our position in space, Consciousness, which understands our position with respect to other people, emotions, social hierarchy, politeness, etiquette. And third, predicting the future. And so I say that there are three levels of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Now, I give a definition of consciousness, something which eludes some of the greatest philosophical works, I think. I read a number of treaties on consciousness, and they never define it. I give a definition in one sentence, and that is, consciousness is the process of creating multiple feedback loops to create a model of yourself in space with regards to others and in time in order to satisfy certain goals. Mm -hmm. Alligators, for example, would be at stage one. At level one, they understand their position in space with regards to prey. The back of our brain, for example, is the most ancient part of our brain, the reptilian brain. Yeah, uh, no, the way in the back of the brain, the medulla, the cerebellum, oh, yeah. balance, for example, in a car accident. You would sustain injury here, your sense of balance is thrown out, territoriality, hunger. Mm -hmm. Then the center part of the brain develops when you're an adolescent. That's the monkey brain, the, the brain of social hierarchies. That's when children have to learn politeness. That's when they have to learn social etiquette and the social hierarchy and control their emotions. And then the last part of the brain to develop is the front, the prefrontal cortex, and that is the thinking brain, and that di differentiates us from the animals. Animals have level one consciousness, they understand their position in space. Monkeys have level two, that is they understand their relationship to other monkeys. But only humans have level three consciousness, which is understanding tomorrow, mm -hmm. the future. We daydream, we scheme, we plan, 
Animals don't do that. It's all instinctual for animals. And then a scientist says, well, this scale is very nice, but what is your unit? Your unit of consciousness. My one unit of consciousness is a thermostat. One feedback loop that allows you to monitor the temperature in a room because it senses its position with regards to temperature. A flower may have 10 or so because it has to monitor temperature, humidity, water, sunlight, so on and so forth. And then by the time you hit a reptile, maybe a hundred different kinds of feedback loops. By the time you go to a mouse, perhaps thousands of feedback loops. And then we, as humans, we're the only ones who see tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If you have a pet, like a dog or a cat, you can teach it many tricks except understanding tomorrow. So then, where would you put numerically our consciousness? And well, how we exactly be... do you get to that number? Because you're talking about measuring consciousness and you mentioned those 20,000 papers. Most of them, or many of them say you cannot really measure consciousness. You cannot even identify, some of them say, the brain structure that it asso it's associated with, uh, arguably. What would you want to say about that? I think we can rank up the scale and measure the consciousness of anything, even robots, even extraterrestrial intelligence, um, animals, dogs, cats, and pets, on the number of feedback loops. Mm -hmm. For example, a thermostat would have one unit, a flower would have 10 units, but think of a crocodile. Frogodile, crocodile has multiple feedback loops because it has to understand its position in space and then its prey, understand the behavior of the prey. And by the time you go to monkeys, it's even much larger. Monkeys have to understand emotions. They have to read body language. They have to understand their position in a social hierarchy, coalitions, who's your friend, who's your enemy. Things that are very, very complex are involved in monkeys. And by the time you reach a human, the total number of feedback loops involved in predicting the future is enormous. Yeah, I understand that, but my concern here is that we kept kind of a relative scale. So, human relative to a monkey, monkey relative to alligator, alligator relative to a flower. Right. But do we get an absolute measurement? Because, I mean, isn't that what science is all about? To have a mathematically precise exact number in the end of the day. Right. So, in other words, I would give a test to a human to rank their level of consciousness. It's not an IQ exam. That's the first thing you think of an IQ exam. Mm -hmm. But when you follow people with high IQs over 20, 30 years, you find a lot of marginal people, petty criminals, people on the margins of society. IQ tests do not strongly correlate with success in life. However, there they is one characteristic. Criminals. However, when you look at a criminal, yeah. you realize that safe crackers, even though they may have low IQs because they flunked grade school, they may understand the future of a bank robbery much better than the police. Exactly. They can outwit the police because they can dream up scenarios yeah. more realistically than the police can. So here's my quote IQ test, and that is to put people in strange environments and have them calculate realistic scenarios. Now, the Air Force understood this. Mm -hmm. Long time ago, the Air Force gave IQ exams and found that they were not very useful for understanding how good pilots are in war. They gave them another test. Let's say you're stranded behind enemy lines. Calculate the total number of escape plans that you can devise. And they found that people who have, quote, low IQs were very good at seeing the future. And people with high IQs did not necessarily see many escape plans like the others. And that's what I'm saying. The number of realistic scenarios you can compute for a given situation, being stranded on an island, of being stranded behind enemy lines, robbing a bank, that correlates to me much better with our level of consciousness than an IQ exam. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, all of this is measurable. We can put this on a scale, including robots. If yeah. my scale is correct, then even robots can be ranked by consciousness. I would say that robots are at level one. They understand their position in space. They have the intelligence of a cockroach. Asimo, one of the most world's advanced robots, I interviewed the, the creator of Asimo, and he admitted that, yeah, Asimo has insect-like intelligence. That's an exact quote from the developer of one of the most advanced robots on the planet Earth. Now at MIT, they're trying to develop some emotional robots. That would be the beginning of level two, and maybe even a little bit of level three, because robots can predict the future in one dimension. Mm -hmm. They can predict, for example, airflow on an airplane wing, but that's about it. 
Yeah. We can predict the future in multiple scales. Throw somebody on a deserted island, let them survive, put them behind enemy lines. All of a sudden you realize that you have to have a full complex of common sense notions about space, time, and other people in order to escape behind enemy lines. Mm -hmm. So I want to come back to the topic of robots in a little bit later, but for now, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the brain on the one hand and consciousness? How does it arise in the brain? Where exactly? And how does that whole process work? Well, historically, we had something called dualism, where the Descartes. spirit, the soul, was different from the body. Then in the last 50 years, we had a little bit of neuroscience. We began to realize that the brain is wetware. Wetware that runs software called the mind. So we began a unified theory so that the mind is software running on the wetware of the brain. But now we have the next level of evolution, and that is the connectome. President Barack Obama and the European Union want to dump, dump a billion dollars to create the connectome, a map of all the neural circuitry of the human mind. So one day we'll have two disks. We'll have a genome and a connectome, one which has a map of the genes of our body, and the other one, all the neural pathways of the mind, which contains emotions, memories, sensations. And in some sense, we're going back hundreds of years into the past. We are now separating the body from the mind by having the genome and the connectome. Mm -hmm. And realize that when you die, in some sense, the connectome and the genome live on. And of course, is this, does that mean that you are immortal? Well, to paraphrase Bill Clinton, it depends on how you define you. If you are nothing but wetware running software, then when you die, hey, that's it. Sorry about that, folks. You're gone. But if your connectome and your genome survive, in some sense, a part of you live forever. Mm -hmm. I'd like to stay away from the Clinton-esque definitions on my show, generally speaking, but they're very funny, I admit. Now, so tell us a little bit more about um, what your take is on, for example, the hammer of Penrose theory of quantum consciousness? Because there are many ideas about what consciousness is, how it arises, where. One of them is actually a colleague of yours, Dr. Sir Roger Penrose, very famous physicist, together with Dr. Stuart Hammer, of whom I previously interviewed on this show. So their theory is kind of very controversial and ostracized generally in the field. In fact, during my Global Future 2045 conference, I was kind of surprised to see Ray Kurzweil, uh, who is generally a very sort of even person, uh, kind of come up very strongly against the theory and saying, we know that's wrong, uh, straight out. Uh, so what do you think and what do you make of that model? Well, Penrose, of course, is a very well-known, well-established physicist at Oxford University. Mm -hmm. I think he's onto something, but perhaps there's less than meets the eye. First of all, the question is, is a computer deterministic? That is, once you push the button, the outcome is known perfectly. The answer is yes. A computer is nothing but a bunch of transistors. You push the on button and you get an output. Then the question is, is the human brain deterministic? Exactly. Are we programmed or do we have free will? Exactly. And that goes to the whole question of philosophy, religion. Are you responsible if you are a mass murderer? Why do we put people in jail? Why do we punish people? Our entire society rests on the question of free will. If we are a bunch of transistors, then there is no free will. So in some sense, I disagree with the hardcore determinists who say that we are nothing but a bunch of transistors masquerading as neurons, uh, that is totally deterministic that one day we can model with a machine. I think that we do have some degree of free will. However, the free will is different from the free will of Penrose and, and other individuals that have written about the subject. For example, if I have uh, a motion picture of a Hollywood movie, everything is deterministic. I know the beginning, I know the end. People in the movie could say, I have free will. I am the master of my destiny, but we know we hit the play button. Mm -hmm. And the play button means that everything is scripted, meaning that this conversation is scripted. Yes. That means that the outcome of this conversation is also scripted. I don't believe in that for several reasons. First of all, there is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Yeah. If I have two Earths and create them four and a half billion years ago and then run the play button, four and a half billion years later, if I have twin Earths, will they both evolve humans? 
And the answer is probably no. Not necessarily. Probably yeah. no. Because of Heisenberg and uncertainty principle. So quantum mechanics does play a certain role in the human mind. Now, if you take a look at trying to model a neuron, realize that neurons are leaky. They're messy. They're not digital. They're not just on and off. Sometimes they, are, they leak. They have all sorts of deficiencies. Neurons are not totally deterministic. Mm -hmm. And I think that the narrower a neuron is, the more leakage you get. And these are quantum mechanical effects. Mm -hmm. So I disagree with Penrose into thinking that that's why we cannot build a robot with human-like intelligence. I believe that we will one day create robots with near human-like intelligence that are indistinguishable from humans passing the Turing test. So I would disagree with my colleague Roger Penrose. I believe that we will one day have a robot that can pass the Turing test. However, I also believe that there are quantum effects. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we are totally deterministic. In the brain, you mean? In the brain. Mm -hmm. Neurons leak. They have quantum mechanical effects that manifest at the ion level because, of course, you have the transport of ions across neurons that, that enable it to fire. Mm -hmm. These are small effects. So for the most part, the, the brain looks deterministic. But I think ultimately there is free will. Ultimately, we are masters of our destiny. You know, there's so many fascinating things that you said there that I, I'm going to start grabbing one, one by one, a few of them. But first of all, let's, let's stay with free will for a second because I'm a philosopher and that's a very important topic to me. Right. Uh, but also I want to push you a little bit more because some of the most famous physicists in the history of physics, from Newton to Einstein, were hardcore determinists. Right. And you kind of break away seriously with that tradition in your saying that we do have free will. How do you feel about that, staying against names like Newton and Einstein? Well, first of all, the universe is not deterministic because, sad to say, Newton and Einstein were wrong on this question. We have quantum mechanics, which is the most successful theory of all. It's successful to one part in 10 billion, making it the single most successful theory of all time. However, it is based on uncertainty, meaning that things cannot be totally deterministic. So this conversation, the end of this conversation, cannot be totally determined. We are not actors acting in a film that is already made and is being shown in a Hollywood movie theater by simply hitting the play button. Mm. That's not the way reality works. And so I think there are quantum effects. However, I don't think they're huge. Some people think that because of quantum effects, we have free will just like the ancients imagined. I don't think so. I think to a large degree, you can predict the future behavior of the brain. And when some criminal says, it's not my fault, my brain made me do it, I say that, well, in some sense, yes. In some sense, criminals are blameless. I still think we should put them in jail and throw away the key for some of them because they're dangerous people. I think there are dangerous people that should be locked up perhaps for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. But is it their fault? No, because in some sense, their brain is largely deterministic and it means that they, it's true, their brain made me do it. Their brain is defective. For example, you can brain scan people who are serial murderers and pathological killers. Mm -hmm. Some of them, you can see that their nucleus accumbens, their pleasure center, lights up when they see images of people being tortured. They love the idea of torturing other people. But does that mean you put them in jail? Only if they commit a crime. Once, you, once they commit a crime, you put them in jail. Are they at fault? No, I don't think so, because the word fault is a human word that has no scientific justification. Blame, fault, these are words that humans have used to describe other people's behavior they don't like, even when they're, quote, not at fault because their brain made them do it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's very fascinating, and that kind of connects with my next question on the brain here, which is in two parts. The first part is, do you think that the brain is properly a classical computer then in that sense? No, it's not, a, it's not a Turing machine. The Turing machine, you have inputs, outputs, and a program that massages the inputs. Mm -hmm. However, the brain has no windows. The brain has no software. It has no programming. It has no CPU. It has no Pentium chip. It has no subroutines. The brain doesn't have any of the standard characteristics of a Turing machine or a digital computer. The brain is a very sophisticated neural network. 
It is a learning machine. It rewires the resistance of all its connections upon learning any task. And that's why for the last 50 years, I think we were, we were on, a, on a wild goose chase trying to create a digital computer that can mimic the human brain. The human brain is a learning machine. It's quite different from a digital computer. And, and the next step there is brought to us by the research of Dr. Norman Deutsch from the University of Toronto. Uh, and in a book called The Brain That Changes Itself, Dr. Deutsch speaks about what he calls neuroplasticity and about the fact that in his view, the brain is not a machine at all and it has to be understood on its own terms because if you accept the, the idea of a brain, the brain as a machine of any kind, then that leads to what he calls neurological fatalism, which is not able to explain how the brain is actually able to uh, grow and heal itself. And then he talks about the sort of the feedback loop between the thoughts that can actually change your brain and also, of course, the brain changing your thoughts. Well, I think the brain is a machine. It's a biological machine very sophisticated, and we have not yet been able to even mimic uh, a fraction of the capabilities of the brain. But I think the brain is a machine. But does now, it have neuroplasticity? Oh yeah, it can rewire itself. Ne uh, neural networks uh, change themselves all the time. The question is, does it have a soul? That's an additional question, okay? Uh, a biological machine may have a soul, and being a physicist, I say that all theories have to be tested, uh, they have to be reproducible and falsifiable. So if people believe in soul, then we have to measure it. And people have tried. When people die, scientists have tried to measure whether or not the weight of a body changes when you die. And we find no visible change. So at, at a certain point, the idea of a soul is that in some sense untestable, not reproducible, not falsifiable not necessarily wrong, it just means it's outside the boundaries of science. And so of course the brain is a biological machine. It's a machine that rewires itself. It's a machine that is not a Turing machine. Mm -hmm. The brain is not a standard Turing machine. The brain has no programming. Where's the programming? Where's the windows? Where's the operating system up there? There is none. Because it does one thing much better than any Turing machine, and that is it learns by rewiring itself. So the brain is a biological machine. The question is, does it have a soul? And my answer is, I don't know. I'm a physicist. I only work with things that are testable, falsifiable, and reproducible. And until someone can give me an experiment that allows me to test and reproduce and falsify a theory of soul, I'll say that the jury is out. Yeah, I remember when I was undergrad in philosophy, we had this joke uh, because Aristotle, I think, coined the term psychology which directly translated, I think, means study of the soul or the science of the soul. And therefore, the paradox is that it's a science of something that scientifically we cannot prove exists. Mm -hmm. So that was the joke from us philosophers to those of our colleagues who are studying psychology. See, the main thing is it has to be testable, falsifiable, and reproducible. Look at Freudian psychology, for example. Uh, for many, many decades, scientists laughed at Freudian psychology as being nothing but all, all these uh, highfalutin words that mean nothing. However, now with brain scans looking at blood flow in the brain, you can actually see that most of the brain's activity is unconscious, there is an unconscious mind, and the ego, the superego, the libido that Freud talked about, there it is. The ego, our sense of self, is right behind our forehead. Our libido, our pleasure center, is the nucleus accumbens, located dead center in the brain. And the superego, our conscience, is the orbital frontal cortex located right behind our eyeballs. You can actually now test aspects of Freudian psychology because of physics. Physics has revolutionized everything. In the last 10 years, we've learned more about the mind and the brain than in all of human history combined. And what was the master stroke that made it all possible? Physics, physics and computers. Yeah, uh, that kind of leads me to the next kind of half joke, half serious question about whether at the bottom of end everything fundamentally we find mathematics or physics or God or something else. What's the underlying, underpinning reality of everything? Physics. That's why <laughs> I became a physicist. <laughs> 
So right. the mathematicians are wrong, therefore. Well, not necessarily, because to describe physics, you have to describe physics in the language of, of mathematics. But just realize that physicists, in general, try to go to the core of what makes things work. For example, back in the 1950s, it was physicists who said, Urban Schrodinger, for example, mm -hmm. that there has to be a molecule that encodes life. And then Francis Crick, another physicist, enlisted a, biology, a biologist, James Watson, to actually find the molecule, and it's called DNA. And then another theoretical physicist, Walter Gilbert at Harvard, then began the process of reading this whole process. All of them won the Nobel Prize, all of them were physicists, and they founded a huge branch of biology, and it was because of physics, quantum physics, that made it possible. Yeah, but you know what, I totally agree with you, but here's a funny story that happened to me two hours before I came here on the way. I get into the taxi cab and the driver asks me where to and I give him the address and he's asking me very nicely, where, what are you doing there, who are you going to see? And I tell him, I'm going to see Dr. Michio Kaku. So he asks me, okay, who is Dr. Kaku? And I tell him, well, he's one of the founders of string theory, string field theory. And then he asks me, what is this? I say, well, this has to do with sort of the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang Theory, the multiverses, etc. And to, he, to that, his response was like, some people are crazy. <laughs> so how do you feel about that kind of attitude, which seems to be kind of surprisingly prevalent in, in a large part of our population today in a 21st century advanced world? Like well, in I, think, New York. I think he's right. There are crazy people out there because the universe is crazy. If form and content, if appearance and essence were the same thing, there'd be no necessity for science. The whole purpose of science is to see the difference between appearance and essence. In other words, the universe is crazy. In fact, it is crazier than we can even imagine. Who would have thought we would have quantum mechanics? Who would have thought we could have dead cats and, and live cats existing simultaneously? Who would have thought that you could be in many places at the same time? That's called craziness. It's also called modern physics. And, and I love it, by the way. Uh, so what's your biggest dream? When, when we talk about the two most important or kind of more, most complicated and interesting things in the universe, one being the brain, the other the universe itself, what's your biggest dream? What's your biggest goal? What's the thing that's pushing you to do your work every day? Well. Einstein once said that when he wakes up in the morning, the first thing he does is he tries to create a universe. That is, if you were a god, what ingredients would you require to create a universe? Would you want a universe of space or time or electrons or atoms? How would you create a universe? And believe it or not, when we string theorists wake up in the morning, that's more or less what we do. We want to know, gee, did quote, God have a choice? Is there only one universe that satisfies all the postulates? Are there many universes that do this? And what ingredients do you want in a universe? For example, I work on string theory, which is a theory defined in 10 dimensions. But now we realize there's an 11th dimension lurking out there. There perhaps are membranes that coexist with strings, and we're clueless. Clueless as to write the fundamental equations of what is called M theory. And so when I wake up in the morning, that's what I do. I say, if I'm God and I can create a universe, how would I create it? What is the minimum necessary ingredients that I want in a universe? Because right now, everything's up for grabs. We don't know what the final equations are of M theory. So does that mean to say, let me see if I get this right. Does it mean to say that you actually want to do one better on E equals MC squared? Oh, a lot better, right? <laughs> we want an equation no more than one inch long that would allow us to, quote, read the mind of God. Now, e equals mc squared unlock the secret of the stars. That's why we have sunshine. That's why we're here today. The energy you see around you came from the sun because hydrogen turned into energy. But Einstein wanted an equation that would give us the entire universe. The, theory of the creation of the universe, the formation of stars and galaxies and planets, maybe even people and love a single formulation that would summarize all of physics. Now today, we can put all the known laws of physics on a sheet of paper. Believe it or not, the standard model plus relativity can be placed on one sheet of paper. So we know that the universe is simpler than we thought, but it's not enough. That sheet of paper only describes 4% of the universe. It describes the universe of atoms. 
It does not describe dark matter. It does not describe gravity. It does not describe dark energy, which make up 96% of the universe. For that, you need string theory. But here's my concern at this as a philosopher. My concern is this. If you're able to create that one inch equation that explains everything, including love, as you said, then, in my opinion, that would mean the end of free will, isn't it? No. If you are watching a chess game and you gradually, you don't, you don't know how chess is played, but you gradually figure out how the pawns move and so on and so forth, and eventually you figure out the laws of chess, does that make you a grandmaster? And the answer is no. Just because you know the laws of chess does not mean you become a grandmaster at chess, and that's where we are going. We already have a theory of almost everything, a theory of 4%. We have that theory. Okay? Oh, 4% is far from everything. But string theory would give us perhaps a theory of 100%. Dark matter, for example, will be nothing but the next set of higher vibrations of the string. Mm -hmm. We are the lowest vibrations of a tiny rubber band that's vibrating. But the rubber band has higher vibrations, including dark matter. And so the subatomic particles, including dark matter, are nothing but musical notes on a string. Physics is nothing but the harmonies you can write on vibrating strings. Chemistry is nothing but the melodies you can play on strings. The universe is a symphony of strings, and the mind of God that Albert Einstein wrote about for the last 30 years of his life, the mind of God is cosmic music resonating through 11-dimensional hyperspace. And that's very beautifully musically said. But then Einstein also said that God would not play dice with the universe. Well, I'm sorry, he's and he probably was wrong on that wrong question. Wrong on that one, yes. <laughs> right? So we have to take everything with a grain of salt, I think, even if it comes from Einstein. But let us zoom back on a smaller project than the universe, and which is your most recent book, which is The Future of the Mind, The Scientific Quest to Understand, Enhance, and Empower the Mind. So, Dr. Kaku, would you be so kind to tell us the future of the mind, please? Well, we are going to be able to do things that are in science fiction. Telepathy, reading minds, telekinesis, moving objects with the mind, recording memories, uploading memories like in The Matrix, and even photographing dreams like in the movie Inception. In fact, we can do all of the above already on a primitive level. We can photograph dreams now. We can actually photograph thoughts inside the mind. We can transfer these thoughts from brain to brain. These are things that are done in the laboratory today. For example, recording a memory. In mice, you can actually record the impulses across the hippocampus, which is the gateway to memory of the brain, insert it back into the mouse's brain after it forgot that memory and it remembers. We can record memories now. And so the, the future of the internet will be brain net. That is, we'll send emotions and feelings across the internet. That's the future of the movies. Instead of looking at a flat screen with sound, we'll have full immersion entertainment. We'll feel, we'll have the memories, we'll have the sensations and emotions of the actors and actresses in a film. And I also think that's the future of the human race. When we get into science fiction now, everything up to now we can do in the laboratory. But when we get into science fiction, realize that once we have the connectome, we could put that on a laser beam and shoot that laser beam into outer space at the speed of light. To go to the moon would require one second to go to the moon. By firing the connectome to the moon, where there's a relay station that then downloads the connectome into an avatar, and there you are as a superhuman. Perhaps. Yeah, you, you are now a superhuman robot walking on the surface of the moon with all the memories and sensations of a human. This is the most economical, the safest, and the most efficient way to explore the galaxy at the speed of light. Light beams encoding the connectome of our consciousness exploring the universe. And who knows? Maybe aliens in outer space have already done this. We are only maybe 100, 200 years away from this capability of creating a network of consciousness throughout the galaxy. I mean, throughout our local sector, and then, of course, out to the entire galaxy. Maybe aliens have already done it. Maybe they already explored the universe at the speed of light. Forget flying saucers and forget landing on the White House lawn with, a, with a, an alien device. 
light beams that could be the way to explore the universe and that's fascinating especially if we can free ride on those relay stations that the aliens hopefully have already established but if there weren't no such relay stations then how do we establish them because let's say some star is like 5000 light years away we need to have that relay station to accept the signal and reproduce you or re-upload you into an avatar body so how do we create it there in the first place? Well, the easiest way is the first generation. The first generation has to actually physically go to Alpha Centauri, it's going to take set a up a relay time. station, right? However, there is a way that I didn't mention in the book that's more speculative. If light can be slowed down, and we can slow down light in the laboratory, that means a light beam may be able to go to a distant star, slow down, and then materialize on a moon and then use the materials of the moon to create a machine that can then download other light beams into the future. Mm -hmm. That of course is pushing the limits of what we can do with optics. But we can slow down light beams, in which case we might be able to materialize on a planet without having to even have a relay station at all. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kaku, you talk a lot about what we already are able to do in the labs today with the human mind and some of the future potentially, uh, future technologies coming down the, the pipe. Let me ask you this very personal question. Would you consider yourself enhancing your own brain in one way or another? Well, if it were available, hopefully it'll, it'd be available for everyone because prices go down because of Moore's law and mass production and so on and so forth. Then why not? Why not be able to master aspects of let's say mathematics that I don't have time for there, there are whole branches of science that cannot be assimilated by one person. So why not have a data bank? Just like we have CDs of different kinds of music and things, why not have a data bank of memories? In fact, why not have a library of souls? So when you go to the library, instead of simply taking a textbook out, why don't you take out the CD of your ancestors? Why not have a conversation with Winston Churchill or Albert Einstein? Because their thoughts, memories are encoded on a disk that you can simply take out from a library. This could be possible. One day you'll be able to chat with your ancestors. So it seems that you're not only open to enhancing your own brain as it is in the, physio in the physical uh, substance of it, but you're also open to uploading your consciousness into a computer um, why not? And again, I don't think this is going to be possible for many decades to come. Perhaps later in this century we'll have a very good connect home, but at the present time we can barely get the connect home of a mouse, okay, let alone a human being. Let's talk a little bit about that though, because of course you have all kinds of people and experts. For example, on my show I have interviewed Dr. Rando Kuna, who told me that mind uploading is not science fiction anymore and he he doesn't think it's impossible that we might have this technology in a couple of decades even. Google recently made news by hiring uh, Dr. Ray Kurzweil who wrote the book How to Build a Mind. So uh, and now of course Dr. Henry Makram in Europe got a hundred million dollars for ten years. More, a billion, almost a billion. A billion dollars, right, from the European Union. So apparently people are putting a lot of money and effort and good reputations are put on the line. So perhaps that timeline, especially when you back it up with Moore's law and our ability to store more and more data on a smaller and smaller devices, wouldn't that kind of speed things up, perhaps? Uh, not necessarily. First of all, with Blue Jean, one of our most advanced computers located at the Weapons Laboratory in Livermore, California, we can simulate a mouse brain for about a minute or so. And a mouse brain is about 1%. 1% had the neural activity of a human brain. So we have a long ways to go before we can model a human brain. And that's just modeling the, the frontal cortex and the, um, the uh, other parts of, of the motor cortex, not the complete brain at all. And we can only do that for about a minute or so. And so we have a long ways to go before we can model the entire brain. And remember that just because we have the human genome, does not mean that we can create imaginary life forms out of, out of nothing like, like, like in the gods. Uh, we cannot create pegasus, we cannot create flying uh, pigs, even if we have the genome of pigs and the genome of, of cattle and horses. So having the connectome is not enough. It may take many more decades to understand how the connectome is, is put together. Now, to people who work with the Blue Gene Computer in Livermore National Laboratory, Say that a blue gene computer that can mimic the brain 
will be the size of a city block, one city block. The energy necessary to fire it up will be about um, a trillion watts, the output of a nuclear power plant, and it would take a river, a river to cool it down. Now our brain operates at 20 watts. So in other words, when someone calls you a dim bulb, that's a compliment. <laughs> it's a compliment. 20 watts can do more than one a city block nuclear power worth station. of blue gene computers energized by a nuclear power plant. Yes. So you see that we have a long ways to go before we can map the connectome and then understand how the connectome fits together. Yeah, but, but let me question that math again a little bit here because that's the math with today's technology, but in 30 years from now, that like size factor would shrink exponentially. I mean, Ray Kurzweil often talks about how when he was a student in MIT, a computer took a building, now he has, you know, today you often give the example that in our cell phones today we have more computing power than NASA had when they landed on the moon. That's right. Right? So wouldn't that shrink again substantially? We're talking about 20 to 30 years. So that one block computer would probably fit on a desk. Well, there are problems. First of all, Moore's law is slowing down now. Uh, is it? That's it is. another point I You can talk, talk to any about. physicist yeah. who works in the field. I've talked to physicists at IBM in Zurich, Switzerland, mm -hmm. and they say, yeah, they can see it now. It, it's slowing down. And the reason is obvious. You're eventually going to bump up against the fact that silicon is incapable of sustaining <clears throat> these calculations at the molecular level. Your laptop computer today may have a layer about 20 atoms across. That's about the limit of what we can do with computers today, about 20 atoms. Mm -hmm. In 10, 15 years, it'll be down to five atoms. At that point, it leaks. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle yeah. comes in. Heat generated and lost through leakage is enough to kill you. And that's the reason why we have to go beyond silicon. The silicon era is coming to a close, just like the test tube era came to a close in the 50s. We're coming to a close on the age of silicon. Silicon Valley could become a rust belt. The next generation of computers may be molecular computers, quantum computers, atomic computers, DNA computers, protein computers, and quantum dot computers. Photons or three-dimensional. Photonic computers. None of them are ready for prime time. Mm -hmm. For example, molecular computers is perhaps the best bet, but we don't know how to mass produce them. We don't know how to wire them. I mean, they're molecules after all, yes. right? Quantum computers are even worse. If someone were to sneeze uh, hundreds of feet away, that sneeze would be enough to vibrate the atoms so they're no longer in synchronization, and you lose coherence. Decoherence is the major problem for quantum computers. That's why the NSA, that's why the U.S. government has basically said that it's not realistic at the present time to build quantum computers. And yet, I've interviewed Dr. Jordi Rose from D-Wave, who has sold quantum computers to Google, to I think the University of California, uh, maybe was it McDonnell Douglas? So I think they've sold three of those so far. Well, I'll have to look at the equations and the blueprints, but I have my doubts. I think that what they have is not what they claim to have. What they have does not live up to the hype and the propaganda because of the decoherence problem. The world's record for a quantum computer calculation is 3 times 5 is 15. IBM set that world's record. Now that doesn't sound like much, but go home tonight is a homework problem. Take 5 atoms, 5 atoms, and multiply 3 times 5 is 15. And now you begin to realize how hard it is to build a quantum computer. I really doubt they have done that. Well, we had a two and a half hours interview uh, with Dr. Jordi Rose where we addressed every single point of that which was submitted by... Except the main point decoherence. That's the killer question. We physicists, we need two, we need vats of liquid helium to even get five atoms to resonate correctly. Mm -hmm. And someone's going to sell this commercially. And again, I have not seen the blueprints. I have not seen the equations, but I have my doubts. And I, I respect that very much. I'm, I don't know much about quantum physics, so I'm not an expert. Well, I, I teach quantum physics and I tell you it's a killer. But then the question to me as an observer would be, why would companies like Google, like the University of California or McDonnell Douglas, uh, I can't remember if it's McDonnell Douglas or one of the other airplane makers, but anyway, buy those machines if they don't do what they say they do. Because, because they're 30, 20, 30 million dollars a piece. Well, I trust the NSA. 
because, of course, documents from the NSA are being released by uh, that uh, Mr. Snowden. Recently, he released another set of documents about quantum computers. And yes, the CIA, the NSA, they've all been interested in quantum computers, and they all came to the same conclusions. Nope, not, not in the coming decades. I trust the, the evaluation of the CIA and the NSA more than a purchase agent at Google. Mm. And yet, I am a little skeptical myself on NSA and, and its trust trustworthiness. And I think we do have history of both. No, they're the NSA very trustworthy. The they, they just can't keep mistakes. The, the NSA is very trustworthy. They, they just can't keep their secrets secret. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> and they want to go into our own, but that's. A, and again, uh, I have not seen the equations. I have not seen the blueprints. Yes. But when I do see them, I would suspect that I will find a flaw in that one characteristic, which is the killer: decoherence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is, these atoms basically fall out of phase. Someone sneezing a mile away can disturb your coherence and it goes out the window. Mm -hmm. That's why we don't have quantum computers today. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't the CIA buy these things? If Google buys them, why doesn't the CIA buy these things? If they bought them, would we know about it? Well, maybe not, but like I said, um, why don't we have a gold rush? We're talking about Nobel Prizes at stake. We're yes. talking about being the next Thomas Edison, yes. right? Yes, yes. I don't see that happening. Yeah, okay. And in my field, quantum physics, we laugh at these, at these uh, statements. Mm -hmm. Well, let us, let us go back to the brain and, and let me ask you this. So, what is, in your opinion, the biggest misconception about the human brain that kind of irks you maybe a little bit and you want to make sure you go, just like what you just said about quantum physics and the fact that they're not uh, those computers are not uh, likely to exist right now. What's the biggest misconception about the brain? Well, you know, back in the 1950s, the CIA and the government was very worried about brainwashing. And during the Korean War, we saw American GIs denounce the United States. So we thought that the communists came up with a new way of manipulating the brain. Drugs and hypnosis and uh, power of suggestion and all sorts of cockamamie ideas were tried by the CIA. And it came out as a program called MKUltra, a multi-million dollar program enlisting physicists, chemists, psychics, anybody who claimed to be able to locate Soviet subs, anyone who claimed to be able to understand what's happening in the minds of Khrushchev and other people, were enlisted by the CIA. I've seen some of these documents. Out of all this, what came out of it? Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Mind reading, uh, trying to understand the inner workings of the mind, trying to locate Soviet submarines. Because there is this misconception. This misconception is that maybe the mind by itself has these psychic powers that we can move objects with the mind. No, nope. I don't see any evidence of this. But now in the laboratory, that's what we do. We hook the mind to an exoskeleton, and you can actually move like Iron Man with an exoskeleton with, with uh, exo arms and legs, more powerful than ordinary arms or legs. We can connect the human brain to the internet. We can send impulses across the internet and drive robots on the other side of the earth. This has been done from Duke University to Japan. Have a monkey controlled by the internet, another robot on the other side of the planet Earth. So telepathy, telekinesis, recording memories, photographing dreams, these are things that are being done in the laboratory today. Mm -hmm. And so the common misconception is the brain has somehow these superpowers that can do this. Wrong. But with physics, we can now do all of the above in the laboratory. Yeah, and that's, that's fascinating, of course. Uh, now, let me ask you this, though, and how is that connecting towards the quest of creating artificial intelligence? Because there's this debate. Ray Kurzweil, for example, has gone on the record very clearly to state that he believes that sort of reverse engineering the human brain would help us very much and put us very close to towards realizing artificial intelligence. It seems that Google is accepting that argument because they've hired him to be their chief engineer. There's other people who have criticized Ray and have said that, you know, just like, for example, we don't imitate the way birds fly, we have airplanes which fly in a very different way. We do not necessarily need to reverse engineer the human brain to create artificial intelligence. And there's evolutionary approaches which seem to be working perhaps the best so far. Whereabouts do you stand on this 
about the connection between reverse engineering the brain and artificial intelligence? My attitude is all of the above. That is, we don't have the royal road to consciousness now. It's not dreams, as Sigmund Freud thought. There are many approaches, and my, my attitude is let's pursue all of them. In fact, if you take a look at the split between the European Union and President Barack Obama, you realize that there are two different paradigms being pursued. The Europeans are trying to create a computer model, a model with blue gene, for example. Whole brain simulation. Right. So using the repetition of modules in a computer program to simulate the prefrontal cortex and the occipital lobe and the parietal lobe, that's what they're trying to do in Switzerland. Well, in the United States, it's more a question of pathways, neural pathways of the brain. So we're, here we have two separate approaches. My attitude is, is let a thousand flowers bloom because we don't know which one is going to eventually pan out. And so I think we should do both. And the short-term goal, by the way, is very realistic and I think is very powerful, and that is to cure mental illness. Um, as uh, Professor Markram said, we're clueless about mental illness, even though the financial damage that uh, the mental illness creates is many, many times his own budget. Yeah. And almost no research is being done on the wiring of the brain itself. We now realize, for example, the schizophrenia. Uh, when they hear voices, schizophrenics, it's because the left uh, temporal lobe does not communicate with the prefrontal cortex. Therefore, you hear voices without your permission. So a miswiring of the brain creates classic madness. Madness is when you hear voices without your permission. We now know what madness is, mm -hmm. a miswiring of the brain. Mm -hmm. And so why not understand the complete wiring of the brain? I think that's a very realistic short-term goal. You know, I, I totally think it's, it's worthy, but I was shocked when I interviewed Dr. Marvin Minsky, who is by many accounts the father of artificial intelligence, and right. he told me that he thinks that that's a complete waste of time. Of uh, what? Money. Uh, uh, Which of the above? Both of them. B both the, the Human Brain Project in Europe and the American Project, because in his view they lack the theory of mind. And in fact, not only that, but he went one further. He said that it may be so bad that to lead to what he called a nuclear winter in the field of artificial intelligence, because you see in his view that's going to be a lot of money wasted basically, and then people would naturally turn away and back from it and would not be willing to spend and invest again in the field. Well, I think this nuclear winter thing has to be taken very seriously, because unfortunately artificial intelligence has gone through a lot of fads and fancies. We're in the third one right now. The first one was in the 50s when we had chess playing machines. Everyone thought that, ah, we can play chess now with computers, therefore we're going to have robots in our house very, very soon. That led to a nuclear winter in the 60s and 70s. And then in the 80s, we talked about smart cars and we talked about the military spending billions of dollars on a smart soldier. That all went, uh, went kaput in the 1990s. And now we're in the third one because we have Moore's Law, because we have all these chips and gadgets and stuff like that, mm -hmm. we're in the third phase. And the question is, is there going to be another bust? Well, it could happen. So I understand where uh, Professor Minsky is coming from. There's been two busts before, two of them. And the question is, are we now on the third one? I don't think so. And I think that perhaps we've learned something and we now have a new way of looking at things through the lens of the, the, the brain initiative. Take a look, for example, at a biotechnology in the 80s. There was a huge boom. Billions of dollars were spent by Wall Street entrepreneurs in biotechnology of the 80s. What came out of that? A few drugs, but not much, because we didn't have the Human Genome Project. Mm. Now we have the Human Genome Project. Now we know what we're doing when we do biotechnology. But in the 80s, that boom was premature. It really was premature. Billions were wasted. And now, however, if we have the connectome, I think it'll be like the genome. We will know what we are doing when we undergo this process. But the funny thing is that Noam Chomsky kind of very much agreed with, with Marvin Minsky and kind of almost for even the same reasons in a way. And the thing is that the lack of that sort of unifying theory of mind, which would contextualize and allow us to interpret which would be the starting hypothesis, if you will, where we make sense of the data that we gather during that. Well, you see, that's why I came up with my theory of consciousness as a first step 
toward getting a more unified, comprehensive theory of mind. That's why I can rank robots. I can rank extraterrestrial intelligence because it's a theory of consciousness. One, one day when we meet extraterrestrials, we find out they're, quote, smarter than us. What does that mean to be smarter than us? It means they see the future better. Mm -hmm. It means they can model future scenarios with more complexity, with more realism than we can. And why don't we have robots? Precisely for that reason. They cannot construct realistic models of what's around them. For example, one of the big stumbling blocks of robots is common sense. We know that water is wet. We know that when you die, you don't come back the next day. We know that mothers are older than their daughters. We know that when you pull on a string, you can pull, but you cannot push on a string. We also know that sticks can push, but sticks cannot pull. Now, let me ask you a question. How did you know that? How did you know that water is wet? That mothers are older than their daughters? Because of experience. Yeah. But that's what robots don't have. Yeah. And so common sense is a huge deficit in the area of artificial intelligence. But how does that then correlate with my theory of consciousness? Because to predict the future, what do you have to know? Common sense. If you want to predict the future of mothers, you have to know that they're older than their children, which is not obvious. It's not obvious that parents have to be older than their children, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I'm saying is something simple. The deficits of artificial intelligence are precisely, can be mapped into my theory of consciousness. And that's why we don't have robots that can simulate the human brain. Robots are at level one. We are at level three. Yeah, and speaking of ranking, the other bomb that Dr. Minsky threw during that interview with me was that, in his view, the Turing test was a joke. So Is that right? <laughs> that's what he said. That's a direct okay, quote. So can you elaborate? Well, I mean, I did the interview, what, maybe a year and a half ago, but basically I think his argument was that it was not really intended to be a proper test from the get-go, but secondly, it doesn't take into account so many things that it probably should. Like? Well, <laughs> you're putting me on the spot here for, to answer for Dr. Minsky's... Uh, well, let me tell you this, that Turing did not come up with the Turing test as a scientific uh, barometer. Precisely, he just said yeah. more or less, by the way, you yes, know, yes. Uh, he made a prediction yes. that by the year 2000, so and so will have certain capabilities. Yeah. And so it was not meant to be a scientific criterion, because what do you mean by human intelligence? How, how do you define human intelligence other than saying it's the intelligence of a human, which is circular, yeah. right? And so Turing, being a scientist, did not mention the Turing test as a quantifiable, rigorous mathematical statement. Right. What I'm saying is, I am trying to do yes. this. I am trying to give a numerical scale, a number you can associate, or a collection of numbers you can associate with different levels of intelligence. So okay. perhaps Dr. Minsky would be much more inclined to embrace yours. Well, who knows? It's a first step, I think, in that direction. Okay. Trying to quantify intelligence and consciousness rather than waxing eloquent and citing poetry. Absolutely. Okay, so the next step up from artificial intelligence, or perhaps the next sort of macro issue, would be the one related to the technological singularity. Would you mind telling us what's your take on the technological singularity? Well, again, it's like what Clinton says. It depends on how you define technological singularity. Some people say it's when uh, robots become smarter than humans. Other people say it's when robots reproduce themselves to create ever increasing generations of smart robots. Other people say it's when you can upload the human mind into a computer. <laughs> and so the question is, when, which singularity you're talking about? Well, in your opinion, what's the proper definition of the singularity? Well, if we take a look at where the word singularity comes from, first of all, it comes from physics, because yes. we have singularities otherwise known as black holes in yes. physics. And also, uh, John von Neumann, uh, one of the founders of artificial intelligence, was remarking to uh, another scientist, Ulam, I think. Uh, Ulam, right, yeah. Yes. Uh, Stanislaw Ulam, uh, one of the fathers of the hydrogen bomb, um, about a coming exponential, coming exponential rise in computer power. But they didn't specifically say exactly what that was. So I think we should take each of them separately. Okay, first, whether we can upload our mind into a computer. And I think the answer is yes, we'll be able to do it. Again, perhaps later in this century. I don't think we're going to do it anytime soon because we always underestimate the complexity of the brain. 
And uh, we will have to have these theological philosophical debates about consciousness, soul, who are we, if we can upload ourselves. But it's going to be a process. It's not going to happen all at once. No one's, going to announce, no one's going to announce that on 2050, on March 1st, we've uploaded the human mind into a computer. I think it's going to be a process. We will asymptotically get closer and closer and closer, and then it'll probably be silicon consciousness. It won't quite be our consciousness. It'll be a silicon consciousness that we can upload into a computer. But I think, yeah, it's coming. For example, 2045. I'm not going to give any dates because, of course, <laughs> uh, I, I could be wrong. Uh, for example, look at, take a look at your credit card records. If I get all your credit card and online records, I will know the champagne that you like, if you buy champagne. I will know what kind of movies you go to. I will have a very good understanding of your buying habits. And so what, in one dimension, I know, quote, who you are, much better than a biographer who may not know what kind of champagne you like or what kind of movies you like, okay? And so I think as time goes by, more and more of our life will be online, including our personality quirks, our experiences. And so just on the internet, forget artificial intelligence, just by looking at the internet, you'll get a fairly good approximation of your personality. Mm -hmm. And then I think by interviewing your friends and relatives and putting them on a scale, they'll know on a scale of one to 10, whether you're quick to anger, whether you ha you're very sociable, whether you make friends easily or not, and then get a series of numbers, a series of numbers on a scale of one to 10 in each category, how you, you would react to certain situations. And then I would put all this information into a robot and then put it into a strange situation. You at a party with all these unknown people, somebody challenging you at a lecture, and the robot will give a very good approximation to who you are. So even without having advanced science and, and technology, I think we can already get a pretty good understanding of who you are because of your buying habits, your online characteristics, load that into a computer along with interviews with your friends and relatives, and have a robot give a very good approximation to who you are with today's technology. The whole mind file. All right. Now, extrapolate that into the coming decades. Then you begin to realize we're going to get asymptotically closer and closer and closer to you as an individual. Is it really you? Well, it's not you as wetware and software of your human body. It's not you, but it's a very good approximation to who you are. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to set any dates, but I would say by the end of the century, we'll get things that are pretty much indistinguishable from the real you. It'll react to emergencies, it'll react to unexpected situations and a very close approximation to, to the way you would react. Mm -hmm. That would come, I think, later in this century. Then the question is, the other singularity is when machines become smarter than us. Right now, robots have the intelligence of a cockroach. They can barely navigate in a room. That's level one consciousness, understanding space. But hey, time goes by. We'll eventually have robots as smart as a mouse, then as smart as a rat, then a rabbit, then eventually a dog or a cat, and finally a monkey. At that point, they could become dangerous. Monkeys have a sense of awareness. They have their own goals. They have their own agenda. And we should put a chip in their brain to shut them off if they have murderous thoughts. So I think that even before they become smarter than us, we should definitely take safeguards. Now, is it going to happen all at once? No, it's going to happen over decades. We're going to have decades warning. For example, Rodney Brooks at MIT puts it this way. No one's going to announce that they've suddenly built a Boeing 747 at their garage. It's a process. It takes time. So you cannot simply announce the creation of a 747 in the same way you cannot suddenly announce the creation of a machine as smart as us. Is it going to happen? Probably yes. When it's going to happen, we don't know, but it's a process. It's not going to happen all at once. And they, can they have then children that are smarter than them? Well, maybe, maybe not. Because at the present time, no one has demonstrated that you can have a Turing machine that can create another Turing machine more advanced than the first generation. No one's ever demonstrated that yet. Von Neumann tried, but we still don't know whether Turing machines can self-replicate to create other Turing machines more, more sophisticated than the original Turing machine. That's yeah, because humans don't fit the definition of being Turing machines, right? Yeah, technically speaking, we're not Turing machines. Even though Turing machines can, of course, mimic neural networks, we are neural networks, I think, 
And we, we belong on a different scale than digital computers. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kakl, unfortunately time is advancing, so we're going to have to close our interview in the next couple of minutes. But let me just give you just one here, random question perhaps out of a number that I have from my audience. And this has to do with cryonics. So Christine Gasper is asking, please ask Dr. Michu uh, Kaku about Dr. Moore's challenge to visit him at Alcor. You mean uh, freezing the body and living forever in that sense? Mm -hmm. I think there's a danger in that, in the sense that you create ice crystals. For example, if you take a look at a fish or a frog, there can be frozen solid over winter time, and springtime, you thought them out, and there they are. They've been frozen solid, and yet they can still swim and jump. Why? We know the answer. Glucose. Glucose is an antifreeze. And because these, or, or these animals create lots of glucose in their blood, they're still liquid when their surrounding environment is totally solid. You could freeze a fish in solid ice and it still comes out because inside the metabolic processes are slowly taking place. We do not have this antifreeze. The level of glucose necessary for us to be in suspended animation would kill us. And so the very process of freezing, you have to worry about ice crystals. Ice crystals form inside a cell. As they grow, they rupture the cell wall. That is a big problem facing anyone who's going to be put in liquid nitrogen but, formation of ice crystals. But how about this proof of concept, right? We have the process of vitrification. And I think it's been, I don't know, six or seven years when we had, I think it was, I can't remember if it was the kidney of a rabbit that was vitrified under this process of vitrification, stored for two or three months, then thawed, re-implanted or transplanted into a rabbit, and the rabbit survived with it for a few months. So isn't that a proof of concept that we can perhaps scale up eventually to the human level and eventually to the brain level? Well, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying that the naive version of it doesn't work. The naive version is simply freeze something and then thaw them out and off they go. If you, if you had try other kinds of processes, like vitrification and others that have been suggested, you realize that we're only talking about simple organs. Realize that more complex organs may not survive the process because of all these secondary problems. And as a consequence, they may not survive to create a human being that can think and act just like they were when, when they were young. Mm -hmm. So personally, I think that if you freeze yourself, one possibility is to extract DNA from you. And so maybe you can clone somebody after they've died because some of their cells have been frozen. But as far as bringing back the person, especially if the person's been decapitated, in many of these uh, cryonic um, advertisements, you see that the head has been cut off, yes. right? Yes. Even if you're thought out as a normal person, you cut off the head. You can't bring them back to life. Forget freezing. Even an ordinary person whose head's been cut off cannot, be, cannot spring back to life. And so I think that people who believe in this are going off the deep end. Mm -hmm. Again, that's not to say it can't be done at some point, but we don't have the technology. There's an alternative uh, avenue of pursuing that goal with what's called chemical brain preservation. Dr. Ken Hayworth talks about that, and it's a whole other potentiality of locking in the brain, the neurons, as close as they are in reality, and then very finely scanning them and sort of creating an upload. But that will take decades and decades. We can barely do that with fruit flies, yeah. fruit fly brains. It takes a whole room full of CD-ROMs, a whole room of CDs, just to slice and dice the brain of a fruit fly, which is about that big. That's a fruit fly. Yeah. A human brain, sliced and diced this way, would have acres, acres of CDs in order to reproduce all the wirings of the human brain. Okay. And again, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying that we don't have the technology. Yeah, and we absolutely agree on that, yes. Uh, so, Dr. Kaku, unfortunately, the second last question that I will ask you today would be, what's the best place for people to learn more about you and your work? Well, one thing that you can do is you can uh, read the books that I've written. Um, some people ask me, well, why write all these books? When I was a child, I was fascinated by the story of Albert Einstein, that he could not finish his greatest work. And I said to myself, well, why couldn't he finish it? The greatest scientist of our time, right? What was the problem? So I went to the library and I found out nothing. 
absolutely nothing about the work of Einstein, the unified field theory, a lot of articles about his life, but what about his theories and nothing about the unified field theory? And so I said, when I grow up and I become a, uh, a research theoretical physicist, mm -hmm. I want to write books that I would have loved to have read as a young kid, wondering about these things. And that's one reason why I write these books, to introduce young people to the very forefront of research. Mm -hmm. If you are a practicing physicist, you know exactly what's possible, what is implausible, and what is possible. Most people are clueless as to the boundary line, and that's why Hollywood scares the pants off you, because people don't know what the boundary line is. So I write these books so people know exactly where is the cutting edge, where is the limit of human knowledge, and where we get into the realm of the impossible. But exactly right, because the, the, that boundary line shifts in time, right? And, exactly. And Arthur right. Clarke says the only way you can find how po if something is possible if, if, is if you venture a little bit beyond the possible into the impossible. And that's how that line moves in time, right? Right. And I found out something fascinating. I made a list of all the things that were impossible, the things that violate the laws of physics. I thought it would be very large, but I found out that there are only two, two that I can think of. One is the conservation of matter and energy, getting something for nothing. And the other one is, uh, you know, seeing the future. Other than that, <laughs> watching a Harry Potter movie, for example, yes. I can imagine at some point in the future, we will have the technology that makes Harry Potter possible. Mm -hmm. Magic may become a possibility once we have nanotechnology, for example. And so I began to realize that very few things actually violate the laws of physics. And only two that I can think of that are talked about, you know, something for nothing and uh, seeing the future. Yeah, that's why we live in such a fascinating universe and it's so much fun to be here, I think, personally, because anything is possible in the long run. Uh, but Dr. Kaku, uh, we've been talking today for an, uh, an hour or more and I would like to ask you, what, in your opinion, should be the most important message that our viewers and listeners should take from this conversation with you today? Well, this gets us in a territory that we didn't cover, but I think that people have to understand that science is the engine of prosperity. Everything we see around us, the wealth we see around us is a byproduct of science. Take a look at physics alone. Physicists invented the television, they invented radio, radar, microwaves, the, the GPS system, transistors, uh, the World Wide Web, GPS satellite, the space program, MRI machines, and that's just from yeah. physics. Yes. And so the wealth we see around us comes from science. However, politicians don't know this. Politicians are in the main former lawyers. And in law, everything's a zero-sum game. You sue Peter to pay Paul. That is the essence of law, suing Peter to pay Paul. It's a zero-sum game, protecting private uh, investments. Then when politicians, uh, when lawyers become politicians, they tax Peter to pay Paul. The same world outlook, cutting the pie thinner and thinner and thinner, except now you tax Peter to pay Paul. And physicists are the ones who grow the pie? I say we want a bigger pie. Mm -hmm. Because science is all about creating wealth, not rearranging wealth or massaging wealth. And then let me tell you a story that's kind of scary. I once had um, lunch with Freeman Dyson. I was on sabbatical at Princeton. And he told me that when he was a young man in the 30s in Cambridge, he saw the decline of the empire. He saw the best minds of Cambridge going into massaging money rather than creating money. Instead of going into chemicals and utilities and physics and engineering, the best minds were going into investment banking and massaging other people's money rather than creating wealth. And who are the great minds of the 1800s versus the great minds of the 1900s? In the 1800s, they're all British. We're talking about Maxwell. We're talking about Faraday, the giants of physics. And in the next century, who are the giants? Planck, Einstein, Jones. Heisenberg, they're all German or Germanic, okay? He saw the decline of the empire. And then he says, in the second time of his life, he's seen it again. At Princeton, he sees the finest young minds 
not going into physics, engineering, and chemicals, going into investment banking, Wall Street. massaging other people's money, instead of creating wealth, managing other people's wealth. And he said, that's not good. For the second time in his lifetime, he's seen it happen, the decline of an empire. Now, you may say to yourself, well, what about the Large Hadron Collider? We're making inroads into physics, right? Yes, but where is it based? It Switch should on. be based in Dallas, Texas. The Super Collider was much bigger than this pea shooter called the Large Hadron Collider, a fraction of the size of the Large Hadron Collider. But no, the Vatican of Physics is not Dallas, Texas. The Vatican of Physics is Geneva, Switzerland. My colleagues are leaving the United States because that's where the action is. And fusion research, who's leading in fusion research? The French. Who will, who will attain break even with the French, the first reactor, that's thermonuclear? The French probably at the ITER in the year 2020. Watch for announcement in the newspapers that fusion has arrived, not in the United States, but in France. And stem cell technology. Stem cell technology, a lot of it's done overseas because of restrictions on federal funding of stem cell research. And the space program, we've pretty much thrown that away, the manned space program. In 2025, expect a Chinese astronaut to put a Chinese flag on the moon. And then people are gonna say, who lost the moon? Well, we never had the moon to begin with. The point is, you pay a price. You make decisions, you pay a price. And one of the decisions is to shortchange science, the engine of prosperity. Now you may say to yourself, well, we have Silicon Valley, right? The envy of the world. But who are the people in Silicon Valley? 50% foreign born. You go right beneath the layer of the Bill Gates and the Steve Jobs, and what do you find? Young, bright entrepreneurs from India, from China, 50% foreign born. In the United States today, 50% of PhD physicists are foreign born, 50%. At my university, CUNY, City University of New York, 100%. 100% of our young physicists are foreign born. So why doesn't our scientific establishment collapse? Because we do have a secret weapon. For all the ills that I've mentioned, the United States has a secret weapon. It's called H-1B. It is <laughs> the genius visa. If you are a PhD in physics, whoa, right to Silicon Valley and here's some startup money to create your own company, right? There's a brain drain into the United States, but it can't last forever. I think it's reversing too, unfortunately. Many of them are going back. Yes. And realize that American students, as good as they are, score dead last, dead last in almost all the scores, all the tests in mathematics and science. We graduate many young people to live in the world of 1950. They can function quite well in the world of 1950. The problem is, we don't live in 1950, okay? And that's a fundamental problem with our educational program. We're generating, we're, we're graduating large alumni of college graduates into the unemployment line. Because even in times today where there's unemployment, there are plenty of jobs out there. Plenty of jobs. You can simply look at the WAN ads in Physics Today and other journals. There are a lot of jobs out there, but they require more education. And that's the problem. And so again, if you read the newspaper, is this roaring debate, tax the rich, tax the poor, eat the rich, eat the poor, whatever, right? Who's to blame? What I'm saying is the economy is changing. When I, I read this article in the New York Times, it was a two-page spread about inequality. And I kept waiting for the answer, why? After reading two solid pages of the New York Times, describing, yes, yes, incomes are rising, incomes are lowering, and so on and so forth. There was one paragraph that said, oh, by the way, one of the main reasons for this is technology. And then on to the next sob story. And I said to myself, this is a sign of the decline of the empire. Well, the empire doesn't even know that it's declining. Talking about inequality without understanding why the economy is changing. It's becoming more technological. It's making the transition from commodity capitalism to intellectual capitalism. As Tony Blair likes to say, England derives more revenue from rock and roll than it does the coal mining industry. Because <laughs> coal mining is a commodity industry. 
its time has come and gone in many places, but rock and roll, hey, you know, people will spend money on intellectual capital. Movies, science, books, technology, intellectual capital. That's the shift that we're seeing in the world economy. And so the nations of the future that will be rich are nations that understand the link between commodity capital and intellectual capital. Unfortunately, many nations don't understand this. Many nations are only agricultural. But this morning, you had breakfast that the King of England could not have had 100 years ago. Think of what you had for breakfast. Delicacies from around the world, seasonings that Spice Columbus didn't oranges. have. Definitely he didn't have it. They didn't have that 100 years ago. And that's, that's the declining cost of agricultural products and food. While intellectual capital becomes more precious as time goes by. But yet, no one talks about this. Everyone talks about its tax policy. Everyone says that we got to tax the rich or tax the poor or rearrange our priorities. Rearranging the, the chairs on the Titanic as the Titanic sinks. That's what we're talking about. Rather than saying, hey, let's plug the hole and let's, let's refloat the Titanic. So what I'm saying is, that's where physics comes in. Let me give you two inventions from quantum physics that have changed the world. Some people say to me, well, you're a quantum physicist. What have you done for me? What have you done for me lately? They say, have you given me better color television? Have you given me better internet reception? Well, let me give you two inventions from quantum physics, the transistor and the laser. And what have they changed? Everything. 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 A good chunk of the world economy depends upon transistors and lasers. And where do they come from? Quantum physics. Okay. The lesson here is you can ignore science as much as you want, but look at all the empires that have fallen. Look at all the empires that once had glorious technology that are no longer here to talk about it. Dr. Kaku, you've given us so much to ponder today, and I just want to say thank you very much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure and complete honor to be here with you today. Thank well, you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.